<laughs> all right, how's everybody doing? Did we all do our reading? Yeah. I look around, I don't see anybody whose eyes have got wide for a second. That's good. Yeah, so this is gonna be the first of our like literature discussion lab where you guys got a chance to dive into like the primary literature. I don't have any idea, of course, if you've ever done that before. I think many of you probably have one point or another. I always think it's fun, especially there on that first page, there's like the word anoxia and then like 16 lines of blue text where it's just everybody who's talked about anoxia. And I think that's what's cool about the literature, right? You can trace down these claims. Um, and so today we're talking about a couple of different things. Mass extinction is a pretty big deal in paleontology. I think if you did like word association with people, what they think of when they think of fossils and what we learn from fossils, something like mass extinction is probably going to be the top of most people's minds. And so I really wanted to early on in the class expose you guys to these things. And the word events up there is in quotes. I don't know what you guys think the definition of an event should be. Like a concert is an event. Is a decade an event? Is a thousand years of volcanic eruptions an event? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, right? So these are gonna be interesting things. But I think what's important is that the fossil record is the history of life on our planet. It's the literal empirical record we can look at and test. And so it's not just death. It's not a record of death. It's a record, record of life and death. It's kind of two processes. And so what I thought we'd start with today, we're going to get to your reading. We're looking at Phanerozoic, so right, the era of visible life, the eon we're in right now, uh, kind of that biodiversity pattern over the last 540 or so million years. And so how we're going to start today is just spending some time interpreting this. So you guys can always treat graphs like this. This is a graph of biodiversity. You can see it's number of marine families. So in the most cases here, we're talking about organisms that make hard shelly parts, but there are things like vertebrates in here too. So number of marine families on the y-axis and time on the x-axis for our last 540 million years or so into the present. This is a pretty raw reading of the fossil record. If you sat there and went through thousands and thousands and thousands of museum drawers and looked at millions of specimens and counted them all, identified them all, this is if you put them in families, right? So there's species, genus, family. So this family, like cats is a family, and there's, you know, other groups of organisms can call that. So this isn't counting species, it's counting families. This graph has a shape to it. That's, I hope, sort of striking to you. Because you're like, if this is all the fossils we've ever collected all on one big chart, is this like literally, in terms of like number of biodiversity in some way, so number of families, is this the history of life on earth with us living right here? This is the world we live in. And then this is 500 some million years ago. This is raw. And again, like I said, there's no worms on this. There's no jellyfish on this. They don't make hard parts. They don't form fossils. So this is the hard parts. Do me a favor, talk to your group. We're going to spend at least five minutes on this. Make some interpretations. Just start easy, though. What's the line doing? How would you describe this pattern over time? Go ahead and spend some time chatting. <laughs> The yellow and the two blues, don't worry about that so much. Just care about the big line. We'll talk about those in a second. The overall pattern. And a couple less the final tip in the Absolutely. 
This is also an artistic, the real, you'll see the real one from the original paper and it doesn't. There's weird it. forms, I know there were some in the cave, but there have to have been some more in between, statistically. <laughs> <laughs> so you take, you get it. Um, take, you get it. All right. So I'm curious what I've, I've eavesdropped and talked to most of the groups. What are some things you guys are talking about with those, uh, focusing in on those kind of three questions up there first? How would your group to kind of describe these different patterns? You just had to like write a sentence about a line on an X and a Y plot. Yeah, Weston, what's your group talking about? I was really interested about the permanent distinction and how like you got the big clip and then basically just goes straight up. So I'm gonna say there's our okay, you got you got so part one was the patterns of diversification, patterns of loss, and then of course that's together change over time. So you're talking specifically about what? 
the Permian speaking. So here's the P, P is for Permian. And here's a boundary between two of the eras, right? The Paleozoic and the Mesozoic. This is a big boundary. Pretty. Uh, <laughs> sums up, right? So what did you say about it? It's obvious. So you see a big drop. Yeah, basically, like there's a huge dial, but then like diversity increase. And we talked about the bottleneck event. Now okay. that could play a role. What's the bottleneck? I don't know what that is. Basically, like for population, um, what you hear is big plus. The population dies off to a certain point. Uh -huh. and there's only so many individuals. And then, like, the genetic diversity changes because it kind of is that ringing bells for people from like intro bio stuff, right? So, so those sort of moments. So, um, after a, a big loss and you go from a population of hundreds or thousands to a population of like six, there's okay. genetic things that are going to get uh, randomly that are distributed in those lucky survivors that then become like the foundations for the future. That's interesting to think about and talk about. That's of course something that's happening on like a scale you can't see here, right? Because that's like organisms and populations. We're looking at millions and millions and millions of years here. That's part of how evolution is going to work of course one thing that's cool about studying extinction events is like these are really events so it's not like too theoretical you have to imagine these like actual shells and actual flowers and actual little mammals like like in the moment living through these things what else are people talking about so we talked about a big loss and then sort of a ever increasing growth seemingly seemingly after that what else yeah well, presumably within that event, uh, resources or something changed that allowed for a population growth that was maintained in, or, and by population growth, I mean diversity. Right. This is like, right. This is like number of families. This isn't even number of species, right? This is like whole numbers of families. So it's a pretty zoomed out view. We're talking about really big picture kind of stuff. But that stability on the left hand side, you know, even when there's a loss, it bounces up to roughly the same. So, can you say a little more? You're talking about over here. So, what do you mean exactly? So, the, you know, even when there's a loss, there's a valley, it goes up to roughly the same point. So, it's, it's still within a certain boundary of sustainable. If your group didn't, if your group didn't talk about this yet, let's, let's take a minute or so right now. What is it? What does that mean if like at the scale of whole planet oceans of families of organisms what does it mean that right now it looks like there's sort of like a flat line and right over here like weston said there's sort of a what what how do you even interpret that what does that mean to you go chat about that for a second well you have to well, well there's something you have to correct or that could be the fault of the race is that is that kind of ask myself that might be a green fair to say that the evolution of the yeah all right can i get can i get observations from the other two groups from things you guys were talking about you can say what you just literally talked about or what you talked about a minute ago when you were by yourself the first time just from this group and this group curious what was that I noticed that since this, since these curves are based in large part off of hard shell marine organisms that live in relatively shallow waters, okay, uh, pretend, potentially these curves might be uh, might have some might have some relation to continental configuration, mm -hmm. i.e., uh, increasing trend, especially increasing trend recently with the break of Pangaea, our continental configuration, lots of coastline. So what if our curve through deep Not time, what if this curve of biodiversity is really a like how much continental shelf there is graph? <laughs> a what if that's true? Interesting. What are you guys talking about? I guess I was just talked about maybe like there is like some like fauna regulating the size of like the of overall by biodiversity like during the Paleozoic. Yeah, yeah, what would that even be? Maybe like large animals that can eat other animals. So some sort of like biologically controlled like trophic thing where it's like 
it's hard to imagine. I think you're, it's right, right? Don't you want to find something? Doesn't your brain need to know why there's a flat top? So here's something like people notice. This graph, by the way, is from 1981. There have been versions of it that got put together earlier than this. It's a really amazing thing post-World War II when scientists had enough of a fossil record from enough parts of the world, even though it was still mostly North America and Europe, really, uh, to get an idea of global 500 million year history. And like it or not, shallow water, shelly invertebrates, for the most part, there are fishes and stuff in here. That's our best literal record. So those of you that are like, what about all the flowers and plants? Aren't jungles super rich in species? It's like, yep, guess what? They don't make fossils. Yep. So this is at least, we're talking about the same kind of habitat here as we're talking about here. So this is just one simple thing. And I want to remind you guys, this graph is about 40 some years old, 43 years old now. And this is the raw reading. This is literally like, okay, this area, this, this piece of time has one, two, three, four, five, six, blah, 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 208 families. It's raw. So things like what Henry brought up about, wait, how much area is even available to become fossilized? That's not included here. This is the first draft. This is 81, 1981. But there are things here that if you're a biologist or anybody who likes, even if you're a geologist, really, that are inherently interesting. Is this right? Obviously there's this, and then this. <laughs> really interesting, right? What would control that? When we talk about evolution, when we talk about speciation and genetic drift and bottlenecks and all that, that's all very cool, but that's gene pools. That's like species maybe. This is clays. This is like earth default biodiversity. Should we use this as like an, our expectation setter for like we go to alien planets and we're like, yeah, you should only have about 800 kinds of families in your oceans. Does that even make sense? It's really interesting, right? So something I wanted you guys to appreciate maybe is just the fact that this is like that first draft. And so... A big old, in class, we've been here right now, right? In lecture, this is where we are in lecture. And so in the Ordovician, we're gonna talk about it. Whoop, this is this big old junk. And then is this flat? Obviously there's something here. And then does it go up? These are good baselines, right? These can set our expectations, help us start asking questions. I heard a lot of you talking about these. What are those? <laughs> talk to your neighbors for a second. I might be leading the witness by using a skull and crossbones as the icon. <laughs> so you guys have probably heard before about the big five mass extinctions. And right now, maybe we're in the sixth mass extinction. And the New York Times or a, a book at the airport will be called the sixth mass extinction, the sixth extinction. This is where that sixth number comes from. So this graph from the 80s and a paper that came after it in 1982 are where this idea of five extinctions come from. I don't know how well you guys like looked at other parts of the paper you read, but five, not a great number anymore, but that's where this comes from. And I think it's important for you guys as paleontology students to have that in your brain. It's the early 80s that we get this graph that's really about diversity. And then a paper that follows that that's like, hey, wait a minute. Okay, five. How we, can we study these things? Are these the same? Are these all the same kind of thing happening at different times? Are they completely different? Do they have anything to do with each other? This is really interesting. If you want to know something that's totally a distraction, we're not going to talk about it. When this paper first came out, there's details like this, right? Other little pieces of the curve. And there was a short time in the 80s when people tried to really get after the idea of like, oh my God, what if mass extinctions are cyclical and every 30 million years, no matter what, something happens. And we don't understand how the earth works yet because we haven't been around that long. That's not true, by the way. But it was like really exciting because people were like, good work, 60 million years since the big one. But anyway, people got a head fun with it. There's fun books. Okay. This is what I wanted you guys to take away from this. And of course, you're going to have these slides. So this is only 43 years old. So as always, when I was talking about our space a few weeks ago, humans are always learning new stuff. And it's okay to like, this is not, this is not that old. Uh, in terms of like the history of knowledge. So even having a diversity curve, even having the idea of mass extinctions, even having the idea that there were five and now there's maybe six right now, who knows? That's all really fresh. Just to give you guys a little bit of background, since this is a paleo class, these faunas, Cambrian evolutionary fauna, Paleozoic and modern, which modern is hilarious because it does go all the way back to the Cambrian. 
it's just this general idea for like the kinds of organisms people found together. Like when they broke a rock open with a hammer and it's a slab of limestone full of shells, it's the kind of shells you find together. So I'm just giving you this because I know some of you are like, I told you to ignore these and I don't like to then not come back to it. So the Cambrian evolutionary fauna is one that's kind of dominated by trilobites and a couple other weirdo things from the Cambrian. The Paleozoic fauna is one that's dominated by cephalopods. So like octopus and squid things usually for most of our history had big shells. And so it's those things, plus echinoderms like starfish, particularly that group, things like star sea stars. And then that modern fauna, which does go back to the Cambrian, so it's not just modern, but does, you can see on the curve, dominate, like if you go to Florida and look for seashells, it's like these organisms, bivalves like clams, sea urchins, crustaceans like this one, malacus dragons like lobsters and crabs, things like snails. That's a land snail, but you get it. Um, those are those general faunas, just to be clear. I want to go to like kind of walk through time right now, give you guys that biodiversity and then kind of walk through time. So these are slides that I decided to pull from lecture. I was going to give them to you last week and put them here to kind of give you that context. In class, we would focus really hard in lecture. I mean, we focus really hard on vertebrate evolution, vertebrate snake morphies, the clades of early vertebrates. Now I want to give you kind of the worlds they live in. So we've talked about the Cambrian already. Uh, these summary slides, you're going to have one for every period, just like you've already had them for the pre-Cambrian uh, chunks of earth history. And a lot of you guys, uh, you know this stuff because we talked about it in lecture. The Cambrians when hard parts first evolved. Um, all the animal phyla are present in the seas almost totally. And all the multicellular life we think we know about is present by the Cambrian. You guys have learned that because hard parts evolve in the Cambrian, it looks like to our eyes, if we're just going through all the history of earth, suddenly there's an explosion and there's fossils everywhere. That's all cool. There's what the Earth looks like in the Cambrian, um, the geological map. This is still centered on the equator and the prime meridian. So it would be really nice if instead we rotate the globe a little bit so these continents weren't spread like that. But this is about where like today's prime meridian and equator are. That's why these maps are in this uh, configuration. What's going on on land? Everything we're talking about in this class so far has been in the water in the Cambrian. But I would let you guys know that there is really fun fossil evidence of like microbial crusts up on land in the Cambrian. So all of our vertebrates, almost all of our animals are in the oceans. And then I remember really clearly when I first saw a talk with people, and I think this was in Indonesia somewhere or somewhere in Southeast Asia, there's uh, trace fossils of like big snails coming up onto like the beach and like eating at the crust and then going back into the water, like big snail trails. So like still like living in the oceans but like somebody's trying because there's food up there which i think is really cool that's in the cambrian and you guys already know this we learned this already vertebrates in the cambrian are really really not very common they're very small they're relatively simple organisms they're certainly not the big predators that they're going to become they're not the whatever you want to say quote unquote dominant organisms there are things like conodonts but we have good uh phylogenies that would let us believe that eventually we're going to find things like and aspids and the stem of the nathosome lineage. So still jawless fishes probably will find them eventually. We don't have them yet. Next period is the Ordovician. You guys just saw the Ordovician on that chart of biodiversity and like the curve goes like this. So the Ordovician is famous for this event called the GOBE, which is a really great acronym, the Great Ordovician Biodiversification Event. And this is where that Paleozoic evolutionary fauna takes over. So that's these hard shell things, brachypods, that look kind of like clams. Crinoids are these big, flower looking things that are related to sea stars, cephalopods, that's octopus and squid, things like that. A lot of reef forming corals in the Ordovician. Animal diversity is still almost completely marine. There's not much happening even in like freshwater systems. Here's what the land looks like in the Ordovician. We're gonna come back to land here in a second. What's cool is up on land in the Ordovician, there's definitely spores from fungi and then bryophytic plants. Bryophytic plants are things like mosses and hornwort, these little teeny plants that rely on water to reproduce. I always think of bryophytes, and again, mosses is just one example, kind of the amphibians of the plant world. Like they need water to reproduce, but they can live on land if they try real hard, which is really interesting. So there's evidence for that on land. Vertebrates, you guys met a bunch of great vertebrates in the Ordovician, least of all Sacrobambaspis with the little eyes up front and the mouth down there. So that's our Ordovician timeline. So, so 485 to 444 millions. These are all pretty long periods of time. The first of these mass extinctions, the first like, <laughs> in that curve you guys saw is this one, the end Ordovician mass extinction. Massive losses of species and at least two pulses that are separated by like more than a million years. So it's not really fair to call it an event. 
One of them is associated with like glaciation and sea level dropping. The other one is associated with anoxic water, so a drop of oxygen in the oceans. Probably volcanoes involved in that. A lot of interesting debate about that one. We're not going to do too much on it. There's the curve you just saw. So the Ordovician goes whoop, and then there's the first dink is at the end of the Ordovician. We're not going to talk about the end of Ordovician too too much because, as far as we can tell, vertebrates don't care about it. That doesn't mean they didn't. But as far as our fossil record is concerned, we don't see anything really happening. That's probably because we don't have enough fossils of vertebrates. And so we'll talk more about the Ordovician here in a minute. Next period is the Silurian. The Silurian is a really nice planet. It's really warm. Climate's really stable the whole time. You can see the ice is gone. Warm seas. It's the shortest period. Well, silly fun fact, it's only 25 million years long. I guess that's great for trivia if you really want it. What we see that I care you guys know is in the Silurian vertebrate diversity, a lot of those jawless fishes go into freshwater systems. So the lakes and rivers on these little continents start to get vertebrates in them. We're not just in the oceans anymore in the Silurian. Okay, cool. Land is getting really fun in the Silurian. There's definitely vascular plants, plants that have like little root kind of things and like tubes inside their bodies. So they can take water up into themselves while they're photosynthesizing. They're growing a little taller. People always talk about the Silurian at the time when there's the first like forest, but these forests are all like this tall. <laughs> The little teeny plants. There are hilarious fungi on land, like we're talking about columns of this. This thing's a mushroom. There are these gigantic um, fungal, probably fruiting bodies, like a mushroom on land that can be like 15 feet tall or something like that. So you can imagine getting in your time machine and like it's just like a really tiny little field of plants and these huge <laughs> giant fungi. There are animals on land in the Silurian, we know for sure, mostly arthropods. So things like millipedes, things like early insect relatives, things like early spiders and scorpions. They're showing up in the Silurian. None of those are part of their respective like crown groups, but they are the relatives of those groups. You guys already learned about this on Thursday last week. In the Silurian, vertebrates are everywhere, and there are mostly these hilarious little vacuums with spikes and tubes and armor, right? So nathosomes are known. Jawed vertebrates are known in the Silurian. In fact, like increasingly more and more jawed vertebrates are known from the Silurian. That's what's going on then. And then finally, this is the last one I'm doing because we're only going up to the early in the middle of the Paleozoic today in terms of this stuff, because this is how far we are in lecture, is the Devonian. So there's your map of the Devonian world. Devonian is this age of fishes. And you're going to see that a lot this week on why that's true. A lot of continents moving around, a lot of turbidity in like the fossil record. If we go back to that curve, you'll see the Devonian has this going on. And then there's a dip. There's a lot of diversification, a lot of extinction, and sort of these events that are hard to pull apart. We're going to talk about it in a minute, but the Devonian is a big deal. One of the things that's probably driving change is that plants finally like take over the land in the Devonian. You get the first things called trees. You get the first things called wood. You get all these features of plants taking over the land, including probably chemically changing the atmosphere, pulling carbon dioxide out, which they're all doing, well, at least the green ones right now are doing in the winter, pulling carbon dioxide out of the air, which is going to cool the planet to grow their bodies. They're also releasing oxygen. So the oxygen curve is going like this for the first time in a long time in the Devonian. Lots more of those huge fungi. Lots of things like insects show up and some of our relatives flop up onto the land. Some of those Sarcopterygian fishes, it's in the Devonian that that first fishy thing flops on the land to become the first kind of amphibian thing. But in the freshwater ecosystems, in the marine ecosystems, nathosome jawed vertebrates are going crazy. That's what we're going to talk about tomorrow and on Thursday. So I'm sorry that was a lot of blabbing lecture at you guys, but I just wanted to walk through those first four periods, give you that little crash course. Here's those four maps that you just saw. I love these maps. They're really well informed. They're really well constrained. They're really professionally done. There's some conjecture, but they're also really, like I said, as about as well pinned as they could be. Talk to each other for the next like five minutes or so. This is the early to middle Paleozoic era as the continents are moving around, as things are happening on the surface of the earth. What are you noticing? Make some observations. What are some questions you might have about this first bit of the family going? You can see it on the sphere. There is, there are websites. Right, right. Yeah. 
everywhere with the Cambrian. I say that if we look at the map, I don't think you know, by the time I learned it, you can see a lot more like like green, whereas when you look at the Cambrian, you like some old or going out in the desert, maybe like well, it's chilly, and then it's not very typical. It's not very quite other than that. I just can't find the word. Probably the green does mean something. It's because the Devonian was the time of forest, and so we probably are thinking forest is representing the lower ground. We're seeing a convergence of the beginning of the forest. It would have hit water levels. Yeah, see that they're approaching. I'm not in there. If I remember, I think it's like 45 degrees. It says like desert, like one of the globe. That's a good way for ice caps to go more. You know, I'm looking at it. For example, it would be different. The process of getting back into the glacial period is a lot more difficult. And we also see that. Particularly the Solarian, you're probably going to get the northern hemisphere in the next hundred years. You can get the sense that it's going to be a the ice cap forming as early as the end of the devotion. But Riker's not great, but it means we've gone. All right, what kind of things are, are we talking about as groups? I'm not really looking for anything particular here. It's just fun to have you guys think about these things and be like, huh. Yeah, John. several things, uh, such as uh, like the landmass is uh, like it kind of seems like it drastically changes from the first three periods to the the Bonian. The Devonian. Right. How do you mean the drastically bottom, changes? I'm trying to word that is uh, the landmass isn't like as wrapped around like the southern, um, like. Like you mean not, like it looks like the land is like this for three right, of them and then like it's not? That's sort of the unfairness of having to choose a map. <laughs> that poor right. continent's getting cut in an unfair way <laughs> oh. until the Devonian one. It's like, because this map is set on our modern map. So you guys are going to see these maps all through this class where we get to today and like <laughs> Africa's right here and North America's right here. Like that, this is always set with those same coordinates locked in, which is cool in some ways, but then it does make it look like this continent's like smushed until it's not. That's of course not true, but it does look like that. You're right. Right. Oh yeah, and uh, then um, whereas you know, you know, like now nowadays, like deserts are are uh, is is that they're low is they're located at uh, at forty five d d at forty five d degrees latitude. Yeah. Oh, so like, yeah, right now there's a certain atmospheric circulation on our planet. There's wet tropics and like 30 to 45 degrees or so north and south. That's where like most of the deserts are. That's true. It's really interesting. People do climate modeling to try to figure out what would ancient climates have been like. And then look at the rock record, look at the fossil record a little bit, to try to see if we can corroborate the idea of things like, you know, more species at the poles or sorry, at the tropics versus the poles. Has that always been true? Have there always been deserts? Does that band move like this? I'm going to tell you it does. You're going to see it move like this, which is really cool in different times. These, this is so old. <laughs> I'm not sure. I don't want to put you on the spot, Tobias, but as like a geo student, do you know, do we people even talk about things like desert bands back this time? <laughs> like when before there's really like life on land that we can really measure very well? No, I don't really think, not, not that I've heard of. We're going to see in like the Jurassic, like exactly what you're talking about, 30 degrees north, like hilariously huge deserts. <laughs> so we will see stuff like that. Okay. What are the things people talking about? Um, yeah. I was kind of talking about how if you look, you know, Cambrian versus Devonian. Yeah. Um, like how distantly they're uh, in the context of the place to each other. Mm -hmm. so you might see like a, a combining of some of the biodiversity here in Cambrian might have some more isolated. Oh, that's so, interesting. If this if this map of continents is correct, are you going to expect to see like different 
little reef animals here versus here versus here, but then maybe in the Devonians, because the continents are closer, there's more chance for exchange. That's really cool. I don't know. That's something you could definitely ask. I heard this group, I think you guys say like it gets greener, which I like. That's a nice little touch. And I definitely agree. The Devonian should be a pretty green world for the most part. Um, and the Cambrian should absolutely not be. So that's very cool. Just changes. The other thing you guys might notice is like, these are all just indiv individual slices of time. This isn't like a picture of the entire huge duration of the Cambrian, it's just one shot. But like, this is the only picture up here that has a permanent ice cap somewhere. Right now you live in a world that has ice like this and you're used to that. That's usually not the case. The earth doesn't usually have ice in the Phanerozoic, but the Ordovician it did, and right now it does. We'll talk about that later too. Okay. So you guys already noticed that if we look at this whole period of Earth history, the Phanerozoic, and see that curve, there are these punctuations in it. And really the point of this lab is not only to give you some exposure to like what that curve might actually kind of look like, but also talk about those punctuations. Those punctuations are extremely interesting. Those are called mass extinctions. So here are a bunch of mass extinctions that are 2024 level resolution mass extinctions. Not only are these red lines put there based on their timing, but those red lines are big or small based on their relative extinction of things like species, the species loss estimates for each of those extinctions. So I think if you look at this, that's them in 2024, not 1981. It's not the same thing happens over and over and over again, right? This one is different than that one. That's very cool. That invites you to become like somebody, and you guys read papers by people that are doing this, people who specialize in mass extinctions, these massive perturbations when life, life is lost, to figure out the patterns there. Something that I think is really interesting for you guys to think about in terms of like, how do people even know these things exist in the first place? It's more than just counting. There's always, and we can calculate it using fossils to get estimates, there's always a background rate of extinction, just like there's always new species evolving at the scale of the geological timeline. So there's always some amount of life and death and life and death and life and death and life and death. So not only do we have to like figure that out, we have to figure that out, that out in order to even understand if this is significant or it's not. Are there five? I put seven up there. Those are the seven I like and I believe, but there are more than that potentially. Something that's really cool is right now, you can go to a conference, you can go to the Geological Society of America conference, you can go to a paleontology conference and you're gonna hear people like kind of get into it. This one here in the middle of the Carboniferous is like my favorite one right now. Not because it's nice, it's terrible, but it's a really interesting debate. How many of these events have there been? And also what gets to pop above the threshold and count away from that background. And so to give you guys just a little more of that like um, <clears throat> consideration, all of these events have been studied now, some way better than others, and some I'm so confident about, and other ones were like, the numbers are going like this, and I don't know why. That's cool to me. That's cool, I hope, to you as a science. These things all have different durations, like the length of time that everything's dying is different in each one. Obviously, you can see they have different levels of severity, and the way they affect the world after they're done is really different. And so here's an example of that. We didn't, we're not going to talk about this one too much. But the one at the end of the Ordovician, look how tall this is. These red lines are number of species that went extinct. And so in the Ordovician, we can say pretty confidently, a percentage of species wise, this was horrific. But most groups of animals had some species live. So after the extinction's over and the Silurian is going and the oceans are warm and nice, those species evolve and diversify again. And so this ocean and this ocean look super similar, even though we know for sure that like individual species and a ton of them went extinct here. So that's real, right? Species died. That's sad. This event is where an asteroid hits Mexico and kills T-Rex. Less species died, fewer species died, but um, humongous amounts of clades were gone forever. Whole groups of organisms were gone forever. So what do you do? Is this one worse because more species died? Is this one worse, or I don't know what you want to say, because it changed the world more? Aren't these interesting? I think these are interesting <laughs> questions. And how can we compare these things? 
obviously people care about this now and there's books in the airport about this now because like uh humans are causing certain high levels of extinction right now are those like statistically like mass extinction levels they're absolutely not yet <laughs> but are we a little red line are we gonna be a real red line what does it mean to be a little red line do we want to choose to be a real red line <laughs> these are interesting questions and so here is a definition for you guys something you can actually take to the bank that I care about. These events, now that they've been studied for long enough, these are MEE, mass extinction event. It's not just me, <laughs> mass extinction event. Widespread, meaning global. Rapid, usually less than a million years, which is hilarious, right? Um, less than a million years. <laughs> okay. Widespread and rapid decrease in biodiversity, usually about 70%. If you like go to Wikipedia right now, it's going to say 75 these numbers are always kind of like moving as we learn more and more and more. Something that you guys can think about as paleontology students, it's measurable in abundant multicellular organisms with hard parts that fossilize. Worms and jellyfish and bacteria do not tell us one way or the other about mass extinctions. That is a limitation. Depending on what a scientist is measuring, Ordovician's counting species, end of the Cretaceous is looking at whole clades that go away. You can like talk about them as being more or less severe or important. People who do studies like that first one from the 80s at the family level, families of invertebrates, you can estimate how many species that would be. So there's a little bit of extrapolation sometimes. This is my favorite thing for you guys to think about. Depending on how liberal you want to be with your definition of a mass extinction event, there's maybe 24 of them in the last 500 million years, or maybe as few as five. And guess what? It's not the OG five that were from the 80s. It's a different five. Four of them are the same. So we are always learning this. This is not textbook done, science over. This is an active field of research that's super cool. The most recent actual hardcore marine invertebrate estimates of death if you guys Google extinctions and you learn about the Permian, it's going to be like 96, 95 percent. Those numbers are outdated. It's not that bad anymore. For better or for worse, when you're writing a grant, you really want to say 96 died. It's not 96. I'm sorry. So in 2016, this is the most recent assessment. That end of the Permian, that big dip, 81. I think 81 is still pretty horrific. <laughs> think about 100 animals and get rid of 81 of them. <laughs> And Ordovician 72, still worse than Cretaceous, 67. Middle Permian, which was not part of the conversation in the 80s, 62, which is, by the way, different from End Permian. So yikes for the Permian. They didn't consider the Triassic in 2016 because the Triassic is still a mess. Gary can tell you about that. And then the end of the Devonian, which was one of the OG five, 40%. Boo. Do you even count anymore? That's interesting. These things are being updated. So that's the 2016. That's already eight years old. But I haven't seen a more recent systematic assessment that species percentage estimates of extinction. Okay, so if we can look at all these events, we can talk about the bigger patterns of how these events affect life. And what's cool is, no matter what the cause might be, which is what you guys read about, it seems like responses can be really similar. So go ahead, talk to your neighbors. If you can't read this, I'll tell you what it says. It says number of species, number of taxa. It doesn't even say which taxon, because this is just supposed to be a theoretical idea. And then here's time going across the bottom here. Talk to your neighbors. Tell me about this line. and that's probably and that's because of like our like three extinct you know growth in the late period. So why is there a why is this yeah like a drastic and then like a straight shot that's 
depends on what type of organ you're looking at. But then there's a carbon that's going to bounce back immediately. That's pretty hard and fast. But what is how long you call the rule of carbonate for a worse? Burns immediately and the population recover individually and then yeah, I mean, there's just there's certain We don't have an exact. It be like sports talks. How could they respond at the site of the meeting? Okay, so this figure, this figure is from like a review paper that's trying to talk about what we can learn from these events, comparing them, even though they're all very different from each other in the details. So, can some group walk us through like what's going on with this line? So uh, yeah, it's biased, it's left, up. it starts out pretty constant. You know, there's your background extinctions and all that. So it's up and down and up and down. Then a big extinction happens and it drops significantly. The number of species drops for really quickly um, down pretty low. Then it's sort of sitting there for a little bit. And then it's slowly, well, slower compared to the extinction curve anyway, uh, starts recovering. and you get a growth and increase in uh, species um, until it resumes that up and down pattern. Noticeably here that um, once it resumes the uh, sort of like the background, uh, the normal pattern, it's slightly more taxa than before. That was that was pretty thorough. Anybody agree with that? Disagree with that? Add to that? Who noticed something that, like, if I said what you noticed too? I heard you guys talking about it. Yeah, I would agree with what you said. Yeah. So interesting relative things here, right? In this theoretical, this is not data. This is like an idea. A baseline, and then afterwards, a higher baseline with a really awful in-between time. I heard him say something that I like, which was the extinction event is this duration. There's no scale here, right? It doesn't matter. Relative scale is all that we care about right here. A relatively short interval of destruction and death. And here's your loss. Sort of a long amount of time down low. And then a curve that goes up, but not symmetrically. And that might make sense to you guys, right? It's easy to like kill <laughs> than it is to <laughs> grow and live and diversify. So that's interesting, right? These are interesting patterns we can see in different ways around all these events. It's not necessarily always these two offset, but we do see that quite a bit. So what does it mean that there's this waviness here and this waviness here and that they could be different? Talk to each other really quickly about that. What do we think about that? I think there's a lot of ground here. Oh, I mean, yeah. 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 Um, that, uh, well, you can have a long time of there. I mean, there's different ways. I mean, yeah, we do. Like, you know, it's going to change in the context of that. There's a lot of change. Like, what is how many that survive there? How many that survive They brought it over. If you guys wanna, if you guys wanna like start a bunch of like intense, uh, hopefully cordial, but maybe getting less cordial conversations amongst biologists, is to talk about like is something like this, which we can absolutely see, like what is it? This isn't like the carrying capacity of like a pond with a certain number of fish species. This is like a planet wide top of like how many species there pretty much are. And then something changes and now it's different. That's might be to you upsetting <laughs> because maybe you don't not believe it, but like what is the enforcing mechanism? Why are there these things of diversity? Why are there different times in history when the curve seems to, as far as we can tell, especially amongst very similar organisms, be doing different things? What could explain that is a really exciting and interesting question. So scientists might study this by counting shells, which is what happened in the 80s, species. More recent stuff, and the people that are talking about more than just five events, are looking at other kinds of things. So this is an interesting graph. In the original paper, these two are right next to each other. One's above the other. But I want you guys to talk about this one again. This is called community structure. So think about like maybe a food web, the trophic interactions amongst 
organisms. And maybe this way means more complex food web, maybe this way means less complex food web. It's the same kind of thing. This one, you can see the time because I've now put them both on the screen. Talk to each other about this graph. How is it the same? How is it different? This is like ecological measures of diversity. It's not a species count. It's like how complicated the food web is, maybe, is what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and talk to each other about that. Yeah. And there's going to be a lot of All right, I want to hear maybe somebody who hasn't spoken up so much yet today. What's uh, what's something we can tell that's different with the green graph? Yeah. Well, what I was noticing is how uh, wide, how much flux there is during the flux period of the green graph. So extinction is called transition, which sounds like <laughs> pretty evil. <laughs> and then recovery called flux down here, whatever, who cares? But what are you talking about in there? Uh, the amplitude of the waves is dramatically increased relative to the straight line depicted in the, in the red graph. Do you guys know something so cool? <laughs> People who study the immediate aftermath of extinction event, we see it sometimes. That like there are ecosystems that if we model them and their function, they're like more complicated than they usually are other times that are like peaceful. Like that's something we've now seen a bunch of different times. So think about it as like very few species slowly diversifying into more species and more species and that kind of keeps picking up. And this is like a bigger scale than just like how many species there are. This is like, you can think of it as food webs. That's just one example, food, food pyramid kind of thing. Like putting themselves back together. Because as soon as those things start to, you know, you're going to have too many predators and then too many prey and then too many this, and you're going to affect each other one way. And so there are these times when like functional diversity is actually like a little bit higher during the craziness before there's some, okay, stable baseline again. That is so cool to me that if you stir the earth soup for a second it's a real not everybody a lot of people die and then the stuff that gets put back together can be in some ways less and occasionally very rarely even more complex than when it's like stable again all i'm showing you this for is to make you be like oh gosh because it's not like happy dinosaur times happy dinosaur times an asteroid and then happy mammal times that's one example where that did happen. But in the in between, this early time of mammal time, if we're talking about the Cretaceous extinction, is wild. And that's true for some of the other ones too. Stuff happens. Evolutionary innovation happens here. If it gets a foothold during the craziness, you might have whole new kinds of animals that are now permanent fixtures going forward that never maybe could have evolved under these circumstances, which is really fun. So mass extinctions can be a bit of a reset. They kind of shake things up a little bit which I think is really exciting. That's the life side of things. Uh, you guys read a paper kind of about the death side of things, about mass extinctions in particular. So I've showed you that first graph that was a biodiversity over time. That's from 1981, it's 43 years old. This was the paper that came out the next year in 1982. Little fun factoid, paleontologists hated the idea of like colossal, terrible mass extinctions at this time. They rejected it. They said everything happens like it does today, grade, grade, wax on, wax off, diversity increase, diversity decrease. They didn't like these catastrophic ideas. 1980, so two years before this and one year before that curve was when a bunch of those physicists in California were like, 
yo, there's asteroid dust in all these rocks where T-Rex is gone. So maybe it was a space rock that killed dinosaurs and nobody who's a paleontologist liked it. They rejected it. They said, that's not possible. The space rock killed all these dinosaurs. So then this paper comes out that starts analyzing that curve of shelly organisms in the shallow oceans. This is the rate of background extinction. So every one of these dots is a period, a little subset of the Cambrian, the Ordovician, right? All the way up till today. Here's the dots. And so as you go between these pieces of the Carboniferous, you're on trend. You're just part of the usual amount of new species and new death. And then five of them stand out above the others. This is where the whole idea of five comes from. These are the statistical outliers. Don't worry about those X's. We're not reading this paper today. Just trust me. But you can see the end of the Ordovician, that's one dot. This is the end of the Cretaceous when the asteroid hits, one dot. This is the end of the Triassic period, one dot. But look at the Devonian, it's four dots. So this is a mass extinction event in that all four of these se sequential periods, it's each millions of years long, is above the background. So the Devonian is obviously a nightmare, but is it really the same as this? Is it really the same as this? Tell me something about this line. The trend of like species extinction per period going from the Cambrian to now. Talk to your neighbors for a quick second. Tell me about that background extinction. That's what this is. Tell me about that line. Again, the Okay, if you had to describe that line, like what's the slope of that line kind of thing? What are you, you going to say about that line? Gradual decrease. Gradual decrease. When this paper came out, like some people are like, wow, mass extinction events. I guess they might be a thing we should look into. And other people were just like, who cares? Are you telling me the trend line for Earth history is a gradual, over hundreds of millions of years, decrease in ex background extinction? If you guys want to flip that around, and by the way, this is something that's like pretty decently likely. Organisms, meaning animals in the oceans, are like increasingly good at not going extinct. Like some of these organisms as a whole are more likely to go extinct than these organisms under the same conditions? Is there like a background extinction decrease forever? Is life getting better at not going extinct at a time scale that's way above species? We're getting a little hippy dippy here and some people will lose their mind in this department, but it's really fun. And there's a lot of ecological variables we could talk about that make me think there's something there. And again, we're not gonna talk about this too much. I just wanted you to deal with it and see the data. And so taking those dots and mapping them like this is how you get the curve you guys saw at the beginning. That curve you saw at the beginning is this. This is the original OG 1982 figure with those one, two, three, four, five family level mass extinction events. The big five idea is from this paper. It's not necessarily wrong, but we've really, really, really built on it. Some of these events are different than others. We're gonna talk about them all, of course, in lecture. So there it is. You'll see that, this is from Encyclopedia Britannica. You'll see this in a kid's book. Look at that pretty rainbow. Look at the shape of that rainbow. It's a figure from a science paper, which I think is always really fun. So sometimes you make a figure as a scientist and you don't realize that for decades, we're gonna feed it to children <laughs> and feed it to everybody. It's really cool though. Okay. Um, I'm wondering about, we're just, we just hit one hour. Let's take a stretch because we're about to talk about the uh, paper and you guys are gonna talk to you about the reading. Let's take our break, maybe five minutes here. I'll turn the lights on, whatever, rub your eyes. Okay, it looks like everybody's back. So I wanna get into this paper you read. Thank you guys uh, for diving into this. I know like the thing about reading the literature is, especially like when you have to scroll through a 40 pages thing and be like, oh my God, is like uh, not only dealing with that, but also uh, there's almost always, even if you only have to read a small chunk of a paper, a lot of new vocabulary. So it takes a lot longer to read than just like, oh, it's only a little bit he asked us to read because you might want to Google what a bolide is 
or what a lip is. And so I know that takes some time. So this paper to me is outstanding. It's a little bit older now because it sort of synthesizes all this information from all of these different mass extinction events. So these events are all named after like the little piece of the period that they're at the end of. So words like Capitanian, that's within the Permian. You guys wouldn't know that. But then they were nice for the most part said end, end, end of the periods if that's where those happen. Side note, isn't it funny that geologists who were naming rocks were like there's fossils here and there's fossils here and they're different. And so we're going to call them different words. This one's called Ordovician. And then it was like, hey, there's always all this bad stuff happening at the end. It's like, well, that's the, <laughs> that's the transition. So that's kind of why that's kind of a pattern, right? So this is one of these tables. I didn't ask you guys explicitly to look at this table. So we're going to look at it now. I'm going to help you interpret it. The first four columns, this is these authors taking other people's conclusions and just giving them to you straight. This isn't novel data in this paper. These columns, this one, this one, this one, and this one, are people, different people, maybe looking at different things, maybe having different expertises, cataloging the taxonomic severity. So that means like number of species or number of genera or number of families, maybe. It's genus on this one and how bad these are relative to each other, and then how what the percentage of extinction actually is. But then on the right here, this is a much, much more recent paper that's not at all looking at number of species. It's looking at like how many like new niches get filled or how many niches are now empty because those animals are totally gone. So it's ecological. It has nothing to do with what family you're in. This might be big tetrapod herbivores is one of the niches, right? That's not what one of these ones are, but you get what I'm saying. So a filter feeding, non-moving hard shell organism, that still full, okay. So this is ecology. This is four different assessments of taxonomic severity. Talk to yourself about these five columns. How do they compare? How do they not compare? yeah you go back to you go back to Observations. Can you say it louder? Everybody thinks the end is the worst. Isn't that great? Like, no one's really worried about this, right? We can talk about details, sure, but the end Permian, you guys saw it. That's cool, though, right? I mean, that's the, that's the worst one. And all these different ways of measuring it. 
These people all say they're measured. These people have been uh, corrected so that they're all talking about percent genus extinction. You can get different numbers, but still the end Permian, whatever analytical thing is happening in people's data sets, the end Permian is still the worst thing. Okay, what else? Or division, uh, when talking about the uh, genus extinction, those it typically charts pretty high. Or division is number two, number two, number three, number two. But in ecological severity, it's pretty low. Tied for whatever, seven. <laughs> With one of the Devonian ones, yeah. this Fraz fan is also Devon Devonian. So, okay, the, you're going to learn about the Devonian on Thursday, whatever. So the Ordovician, yes, by counting species, maybe not so much by like changing ecosystems in the big picture way. What else? Not quite as severe with the intraats. They kind of have the opposite effect, or it's much lower through most of the right. intraassic fourth or fifth or not. Oh, on second, but not, not, not right. Right. and then third. Third for ecological severity. That's and it didn't have much of a dent in the in the Sitkowski curve in the eighties. Yeah. yeah. Another thing people might notice is you, and I don't expect, by the way, that you guys know which all of these are yet, right? I know that's not fair of me. I'm talking about them like you might. So the Cretaceous, this is T-Rex, Triceratops, Space Rockets, Earth in the Face. Like that's here taxonomically, but absolutely here, ecological severity. So that's, we kind of already touched on that. So it's just interesting, right? This paper is trying its best to give you guys the state of the field, the state of the art, if you want. And so what this paper is really about is causes. We can calculate and graph all day and look at fossils all day and get these things. But ultimately, what we really want to talk about is what's driving the pattern. What are the causes of mass extinction? And that's what you guys are going to be discussing today here for the second half of our lab. And so back in the day, when people thought change could only happen over huge amounts of time, processes that we can see now operating over millions of years, causing differences slowly, nothing catastrophic. Everything was about continents moving how much ocean is available to live in, habitat space, wax on, wax off. That's like how life might be. Things are gonna get colder sometimes, things are gonna get hotter sometimes. If you guys go to the 70s, you're gonna see a bunch of like dinosaurs like in the snow. It's like, that's why they maybe died, it got cold. <laughs> that's not necessarily wrong, it's kind of interesting, but like probably not <laughs> on the whole planet. Like, you think just like, I can't, they died. <laughs> but so these are the original kind of ideas, things like geographic area, things like continental movement, Think about those as like interesting starting points, but what are the like, in this paper, they say it explicitly, right? Kill mechanisms, yeah. proximal kill mechanisms, ultimate kill mechanisms, which are pretty intense words. And so now we actually have a really good idea. You guys read this paper. This paper is built around the idea that like, um, for almost every single one of these in the entirety of Earth history, there's a humongous amount of a lip, these large igneous provinces. You and I and our species, and actually our family like hominids, We've never seen a lip in action. The last time there was one was 14 million years ago. What that is, is almost like a crack in the earth where it's just puking out lava for a super long time. The black rocks in Western Idaho and all of Eastern Oregon and Eastern Washington, that's the last lip. And that's from 14 to 16 million years ago. When you have whole regions of the earth split and just gushing, we have never seen it, but we can see the remnants of it geologically. So these are almost always associated with mass extinctions. That's worth exploring, I think, now that we have that record. Some of these events maybe had this kind of thing happening. You guys know what space looks like. You saw there's asteroids everywhere. There's comets flying in and out all the time. Who knows what else? So maybe some of these events are associated with a rock. Once the one that hit during T-Rex's life was found, everybody in the world was like, well, now we got to find holes everywhere because everybody must have a hole from a space rock. Most of these don't seem to have that, but it's interesting. It's worth discussing. This paper's talking about it. And then, of course, the whole reason science like this gets funded, besides the fact that it's fun and cool and interesting, is that people want to know, like, are we cap capable of behaving like some of these other mechanisms and changing the biosphere? So that's like kind of the bigger picture. So the objectives I had for you guys looking at this paper was to appreciate the scope of the actual causal mechanisms. Not just like what could do this, but like how would that even work? Why does it make sense that a big explosion in Mexico kills everybody in the whole world? Why does it make sense that a volcano that goes off for a million years straight just kills everybody? How? What actually has to happen? So it's a lot of chemistry, it's a lot of geology, it's a lot of earth science. 
And so I wanted you guys to appreciate trying to grapple with these questions. It's really easy to walk around in Montana and be like, dinosaur, dinosaur, dinosaur. And then you hit a line and there's no dinosaurs. That's easy to do. But figuring out how it might have happened is really cool. All right. So for the next like at least like half an hour or so, uh, I'm going to put some stuff up here for you guys to look at. But I want you guys to be in your groups of five and four. Chat with each other. Really get into this. Do the details of what you read. We're going to start with here. How was this? Did you hate it? That's okay. I'll leave the questions up. You guys are going to discuss. Go for it, please. Simple. Yeah. yeah. I wonder, like, if all these are like, 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 like,
Almost every almost every flashback, every glitch on that, every glitch on that, every before the lake was all guys, was great with three. And before the sun is all cooling, I was all of it. Oh, like, The deck of crap did not do this. Yeah, it did We have Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So there has to be, even if these igneous provinces are associated with mass extinction, they always seem to be. It obviously isn't just 
how much lava has to be more than that. It's really interesting. Yeah, the way they're marked on figure eight is just the point. Yeah. May I remind you that there was a guy who claimed that there was a second impact crater on the coast of India that was like twice the size of the tips of the water, and nobody believed it, nobody planned it because, for one, it's not circular. Granted, if you all know the name, although granted, you might you might know Sapphire Chapter's reputation already. Why? But yeah, active. What does this the greater in the only one that says that is greater. I wonder why. I mean, I think that's important. Yeah, uh, I guess, presumably. Did anyone note the uh, order of issue in gamma ray? I think I've heard that. Yeah, I have not recommended it. I think it's like the presentation for that. CLDR, pure speculation. That's what a lot of people do. It told the truth. Out of curiosity, do you know the preservation of gamma ray is speculation on sun cycle or is it on gamma ray? It's like a super I know it was like a like a like based on a big geological Probably the argument would be like that would instigate what we actually see in the record without what we didn't believe in. Why? You want to work? Yeah. 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 Into the nitrogen dioxide that would reflect on the red light solar radiation and lead to the ice age. That, of course, is pure speculation. In which case, that's oh. actually the worst thing to do. So, no, no, that's okay. No, no, no. If, 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 you want, if, you want, if you want, if you want to eliminate, if you want to eliminate mammals, you bring back most vertebrates. Legit, they're all the same. There's like some people who get like. 
you know, a couple of times, really. Yeah, there's like 70% of the super Like, 70% of the super continents would be one in each average of uh, the mammals based on the they all have. Um, each one like we're going to talk about the other the other one the other one the other the other one the other one the other the other one 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 the Trying to watch oh, yeah. every yeah. single face. Quantify how to quantify how It's very bad. It's built, yeah, it's loud. Yeah, it's like 30 yeah. 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 But there are five, you know what I mean? So this, this is why I love this. Yeah, I'm just going through all the next one. Why is it happening? Oh, three of them? There's eight outside there. He did it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's like I want to say some corner. Yeah, I think I've seen it Yeah, corner, but the characters had a top bar. I think that wrong is pretty much crazy stuff. Yeah, lost that. Yeah, they understand how to dress up like an odd or a pop. Oh, God. Yeah, they're going to probably. Yeah, I I have risk I don't read those. Does that mean we're in Houston? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
That's why right now there's the the biomarker marries the friends or the next one. Yeah. If you think biomarker is a current mammal, All right, uh, can you guys like talk in your group real quick? We'll spend a minute, uh, two, three minutes right now. What are some of the things like if you were some, trying to summarize what your group's been talking about? Bigger ideas. I, all of you have been talking for 25 minutes, and I've heard you all talk about a lot of different things. So, can you just pick a couple things? <laughs> <laughs> All right, go do that. What do you think? See, people That's the art well, I guess we're kind of oh, don't forget the uh, not one, forget the alien virus. Don't forget the alien virus. Uh, and then, 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 uh, and
being caused by the light in the we have some of those uh provinces like so they get don't don't hurt the people yeah yeah and maybe yeah we don't want the back for some of the Asian through the duration of the yeah, yeah, you get a lot of gas release as well. And you might hand it to the next speed of smaller eruptions of the season before, like, a big combination of the future. So, you know, yeah, of course, they could be like, oh, God, I'm going to Yeah, we can just talk. Yeah, like, hold on, we're going to talk. You're going to talk about this. You want a small area. Yeah, like, it's talking about street on the wall. Yeah. You guys there in the back, you five. Uh, we talked about math extinctions. And awesome. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. What? what? The major. Yes. Uh, figure. I think it was figure. Figure eight. Figure eight. Wow, it's like lava. Yeah, the, the lips. The lips. And we were looking at like on the right before the Chick Fil A. And of course, are these bigger ones? Okay. So what Chicxulub, though, real quick? Average. Yeah, so that's a hole in Mexico <laughs> that has a name. Okay, okay, great. So before that, what? Sorry, say it again. Uh, you see a lot of the LIPs happen before, not necessarily at the same time as some of these mass extinctions. I was talking about okay. how it takes time for mass extinctions to happen. Like, they're not, it's not the size, you know, some of these that are immediate, like, usually it takes a lot of time. Uh, okay. Anybody want to add to that? Agree with it? Disagree with it? I don't think there's a temporal correlation. How do you mean? These are tens of millions of years. These events are not associated with math extinction. Isn't that just so great? Yeah. <laughs> I actually think, I remember when I kind of clicked, and if I go back to that first slide where I put the red lines on for you guys, it's like you'll notice it too if you kind of look. The Jurassic and the Cretaceous for almost their entirety are like super chill. And that's like just dinosaur planet. That's just like bigger and better and crazier the whole time, dinosaur time, is this period of relative stability. So that's pretty interesting and worthy of more questions. So these... Biggest of lines, and of course this scale is upside down, right? They're trying to be fancy and get it all on one figure. So the more the line comes down, the more lava comes out. The biggest eruptions of the whole last 500 million years that we can tell, because maybe there were some here that are eroded away and they're gone now. But the biggest ones that we can tell are here and they're not at all associated with extinction. I heard a lot of groups talking about that, right? <laughs> uh, I put this up a second ago, but I didn't like call your attention to it. I just think it's fun. This one here, the Kerguelen, you can see it on your map, but like here it is. So just to give you guys where you are, there's us, hooray. 
It's in the Indian Ocean. It's this. This here is a bunch of lava. You can radiometrically date all of it. It's a huge amount of eruption that happened in the middle of the Cretaceous. It's not associated with any death at all. But it's tremendously huge. That's crazy. <laughs> That's what I like about this figure paired with this figure. Is this figure is like the real map of where all these things are that we're talking about. It's a bunch of fancy words, but this is the real thing. So Kerguelen is down there in the South Indian Ocean, huge amount of lava. So obviously, if these large igneous provinces are associated with extinction, which many of these boundaries are associated with very specific extinction events, are very specific lava fields, these humongous ones, at least this humongous one and another humongous one, aren't associated with extinction. There's obviously more than just like, once you puke out enough lava, there's an extinction. It has to be more than that. Did anybody talk about that in your groups? We did a little bit. Yeah, what did you guys talk about? Yeah, a little bit. We brought up the possibility that um, instead of like lava, instead of uh, lava relays being the uh, being the factor that correlates with extinction, perhaps uh, volcanoes really, really also release a lot of gas into the atmosphere, mm -hmm. and that get and we and it's different. And um, that graph doesn't quantify. The gas world, the gas release. So that so perhaps um the worst extinct or perhaps LIPs associated with worse extinctions had greater gas world, had greater um you know carbon dioxide release. Well, is like is that release. registering with people what Henry's talking about? Because what we can go around and look at on the surface of the earth right now is like the lava, the orange rock that cools to black rock, and we get to go look at it. But when these eruptions are happening, there's all the other stuff that's coming out. And maybe some of these are like pretty chill, like Hawaii, where it's just like a lot of lava for a long time, whereas others are explosive and there's all kinds of chemical compounds that come out. That's part of it, right? I uh, Did anybody talk about those proximal and ultimate kill mechanisms? Because it doesn't make sense to me just stating it simply that like a big enough volcano kills everybody. Like what has to actually happen? There's a lot of different variables. We're talking about all these events. You're talking about animals and plants, land and ocean, big and small. Predators and prey, they all are killing lots of different kinds of things. So how is it all kind of do that? You guys are talking about ultimates and proximals. So what were you talking about? Or proximates? Um, yeah, we just talked about how there's like a lot of things that go into uh, mass extinction. And like the ultimate was like volcanism that goes into the proximals and like how um, there's like atmospheric payment and everything. Does that mean, I mean, that I think is really interesting, right? Like. You can have a big volcanic eruption and we can measure the volcanic rocks that are left, but those things that are like changing the atmosphere could be temperature change. We know that that's going to affect things like how much oxygen is available in the water. We know that's going to make things like the ocean more acidic. There's no way you know that if you do enough of it, you're going to start to deplete the ozone layer and then there's going to be more radiation. I'm going to tell you guys about some studies, sometimes in the Triassic, definitely in the Cretaceous and definitely in the Permian. I'm going to tell you about some studies where like we can actually think we see the degradation of the ozone layer, like sterilizing plants. And so it doesn't actually kill anything, but it makes it so that the plants aren't reproducing very well. And then you just do that for 60,000 years straight and you start to collapse food webs and stuff. It's really bizarre. And that's the only time we can really see that. Interesting. What other things people talking about? And you can see how these things interact with each other, right? What other things people talking about? I really didn't know we talked a bit about the similarities between the um, proximal kill mechanisms between the two different ultimate kill mechanisms. So like both Oh, like how a space rock and a volcano yeah, can, can they, do similar things? <laughs> okay, so say more. And, well, we first we kind of just mentioned that they the paper really talks that they're quite similar. Starts off kind of cooling things down and then heats things up. Uh, and then Henry brought up another paper that he had read recently that kind of talked about being able to differentiate, differentiate the two causes um, mm. based on what happens with carbon. Uh, okay. But it is still like it's kind of funny that two very very different large scale events cause roughly the same expected like hot ocean acidification things die. Yeah. Um, also, take a step back, quick breath on the idea that two hundred or so, two hundred twenty some years ago, people didn't really talk about things ever being extinct. That wasn't really like an idea people had in their heads that there used to be things that are gone now. And now you and I can be like, yeah, but at the end of the bony, it's really more this than that. Like, think about how what we're able to even talk about now, which is really cool. I really do like yeah. I found on that idea. Um, the paper clearly indicated that the mechanisms, the proximate mechanisms, were very similar between volcanism and, and boloid impact. Mm -hmm. We were thinking about how you could distinguish from them. And the boloid uh, impacts are, of course, a very 
defined event. They're a sudden event which uh, uh, is quickly there and quickly gone. Um, the other uh, difference is that they pointed out was that the expulsion of uh, aerosols and sulfur dioxide seems to have been uh, more dramatic with uh, the Chicxulub uh, impact because of the strata that it hit. Yeah. It threw a, an awful, it caused, I think the Chicxulub event is really cool because at first it burned everything, then it froze everything. There it is. And then it <laughs> heated up everything, you know. Uh, it's a one, two, three punch, probably with anoxia and toxic metals and everything else thrown in as well. When we get into the Cretaceous, I'll show you guys a figure that like, this asteroid or comet, probably asteroid, that hit, hit in Mexico, and that's like not good rock for it to hit. It could have hit other places on the earth and done a lot less damage because the chemicals in those rocks changed the atmosphere. But there's also places it could have hit that would have been like way worse. So it's very interesting that like the random chance of being hit is one thing. There's also the random chance of where the impact happens, which is really cool. So not only, by the way, not only are there, um, large igneous provinces on the surface of the earth right now that we don't associate with mass extinction events. There's also impact craters on the surface of the earth that aren't in this paper because they're not associated with extinction at all. This one is hilarious if you've never seen it. I think you guys know where I am, yes? So this is a Triassic hole in Canada that like is a crater that is now a lake. And what's cool is that this thing is not directly associated, really, in a competent way with any mass extinction event. But next time you look at the map, like squint when you're looking at the weather, and you'll be like, oh my God. <laughs> so, I just think these things are right there. And that's that's a fun thing for you guys to consider. What did you guys talk about, like in your conversation? <laughs> Literally all of these things. All of these things? Well, we talked about ocean acidification. Oh, okay. What about it? Um, how like it's uh, hard for shellfish and uh, uh, microorganisms and corals, mm. which is interesting because uh, shellfish fossilize like easily. Yeah, <laughs> we can actually see the damage sometimes from like acidified oceans. Like the fossil has erosion on it from when it was living in a high acidity ocean. And now it's a fossil that has these holes in it that we can see in modern shells. You can get experimentally, which is really cool. Anybody else have like big ideas, take home ideas you're coming with you? Like, I, again, this lab is all about you guys reading this paper, having a lot of time to discuss it and like exposure. Because I think a lot of these ideas like take a couple weeks for you guys to be like, well, <laughs> it takes time. Something that they mention, and one of the reasons I really like this map figure, they mention it because it's really worth considering because it's a hypothesis and all hypotheses should be taken seriously uh, for the most part. Um, and one of them was, no impact, no impactor is really associated with an extinction very well in a way that's really convincing, except for this one. So this is a spot on the Earth's surface where we can associate like the end of the Cretaceous, an impact event. But what's also true is at the same time-ish, this takes place, you know, in a matter of a second and a rock hits. But these volcanic situations last for tens, if not hundreds of thousands of years. The one that's associated with the end of the Cretaceous is this one the Deccan Traps in India. You can go to these right now. If you go to Mumbai, above, above Mumbai in the hills, it's like black rock. You can go see these. People go measure these. The other thing people talked about was like, these traps up here in Siberia are the ones associated with the end of the Permian. That's the biggest extinction ever. There aren't really good impactor sites. Not only do we not know for sure that it's an impact crater, but also like the timing is difficult. We don't know. Is this one in Australia? Off of Australia. And this one down here in Antarctica, these are both con candidates. I personally don't really buy it very much, but you guys might have caught it in the paper. People had the idea of like, if you make the globe, not a map, but like a globe, it kind of looks like the space rock hits here. And then on the other side of the circle, there's an eruption. Mm -hmm. This space asteroid hits here and then almost the other side, like, is that a thing? Because right now, you guys might be like, well, I'm okay with an asteroid being random, but we don't have any explanation, and Tobias, please correct me if I'm wrong, for why or when large igneous provinces would suddenly just burp up and start doing what they do. 
Right, that's kind of beyond I, my understanding, like our knowledge. Same is true for like the hot spots, like the one that makes Yellowstone, the one that makes Hawaii. Yeah, we can awesome. track them, we can monitor them, we can talk about them. But what were you gonna say? The Yellowstone thing has been like in contention for years, like whether or not the CRVs, the Columbia River stuff is associated with it or not, stuff in Oregon. It's there's been tons of research into why like these things happen, but it's contention. But I was gonna say, like I, and I would be so shocked if geologists didn't have a lot of really well-grounded ideas. But my understanding as a biologist is that they're kind of like, no one's all set on what lips are and predictability or whatever. I'm sure it has to do with like, none of us think about the fact that we're standing on a gigantic ball of liquid rock <laughs> underneath our feet all the time. <laughs> we all pretend like that's not true. But uh, yeah, a little burps, right? Causing big problems. I think it's kind of fun. I, yeah, I might be able to say something. I mean, this is a heat engine. We're sitting on a heat engine. Things don't move around. We don't have plate tectonics. We don't have these uh, large igneous events without a heat engine driving it. And that heat engine, uh, for the most part, we have retained heat from when the Earth coalesced, but most of it is due to radioactivity deep inside the Earth, which is generating heat, which is generating convection currents, which lead to the plate tectonics. If you have a bubble of uh, a mantle uh, heading upwards uh, towards the surface, it may result in a large igneous province uh, development or a hot spot, depending on its magnitude and size. But this is driven by a radioactive uh, uh, decay, uh, a heat engine basically deep within the earth. I love this image. This is from the cover or it's from an article. I think it was the cover of the journal when it came out. And I just totally stole it because I love it so much. Like, Here's like, this is like the earth from space, but with a cross section cut out of it. It's so like, here's like Indonesia, like this is an island in Indonesia and here's the deep ocean and here's clouds. And then it's like, like the earth underneath our feet being kind of like uh, all the time. Like Paul's talking about those convection currents. I mean, this is artistic, but I really like the, we live our lives here and there's just all this other stuff that even if every hundred million years, it's like, bleh. Like <laughs> freaks us out and kills a bunch of things. That's really, really cool. Um, last thing I'll show you guys, because we talked about it. Yeah, here it is. Uh, this is that same image, but like a little bit like, without text on it. And I just like you to think about the earth, like space rocks are scary and they come from somewhere else. But a lot of these events seem to just be tied to the earth living its little life. Um, Hot spots like Yellowstone, hot spots like Hawaii, they are not ever associated with mass extinctions. They're not the same thing. But we all live near Yellowstone, so everyone always talks about Yellowstone when we talk about extinctions. So I always like to just talk about it. Like sometimes these lips are these lips, this flood basalt here, that's a lift, but sometimes they just make a little cute series of volcanoes as the kind of moves over them, and that's your Hawaiian Islands, that's your Yellowstone hotspot. This is a complete diversion. It has nothing to do with mass extinctions, okay? You're accepting that? <laughs> I'm not doing this. This is just for fun. This is a Nat Geo figure that I just love so much because it's true for us sitting here in this classroom. Here's us, there's Idaho, right? There's Montana, here's Yellowstone, that's the national park. This is North America moving over that hot spot. And so the big flat area where a bunch of people grow potatoes is probably flat because the hot spot's been here and melted through all the mountains. Now you can go there and see bison and a bear. And that's kind of fun. This is like real, like to scale of the hot spot. So here we are in Pocatello. And you might think Yellowstone's over there, but like the hotspot's like right under us right now. And the thing I like about this image so much is this is a like fold out from National Geographic. And I just like it. Oh, wow. <laughs> so like you can go in here and see some bubbling water if you want to. And don't think about the fact that like even if you're sitting here in Salt Lake, it's like, it's right there. Anyway, you're crazy. Okay, sorry, that had nothing to do with mass extinctions, but it is cool that we live in Idaho, and Idaho's got a large igneous province on the west and a big volcanic hotspot that's active right now on the right. Um, that's what I wanted to share with you guys and what I wanted you to get at it today. Anybody else have any closing things they want to say? You guys look spent. <laughs> okay, cool. I'll see you in lecture tomorrow. Thank you.